going to be drooling and not caring. You're going to be over there as a parent going, hey, 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 jumping up and down, right? Yeah. And, and that's what's happening here. Now, forget about that, but look at the features. If you look at the eyebrow, we have a long eyebrow, we have a piggy nose, and we have a cupid bow lip, and a little dimple. Now, I asked my peers, because we're no experts at this, is there anything in this photograph that tells you these children cannot be the same person? And I took it to see about seven or eight people, and everybody said, no, I'm not sure it's not the same person. Now, I felt then that a more expert analysis was required. And uh, I did some reading on uh, biometric analyses. And one of the things I discovered is we could not do a confirmatory analysis because baby's features change so quickly. And we do not know Douglas's age at the time of this photo. So if we had a picture of me at seven months and me at nine months, we could not say it's the same person. On the other hand, you can do a disconfirmatory analysis, and that is you could say that two people are not the same person because you have a lower standard. So I wanted to find out, we, it, uh, can we say these people are not the same person? And when in need, I have always relied on the kindness of scientists. And so friends call friends, and eventually I was put in contact with Dr. Uh, William Rodriguez of the Armed Services Institute of Pathology, who's an expert in this type of thing. And he agreed to look at the photographs. And here's his conclusion. My examination using a simplified cross-sectional ratio comparison, whatever that is, I know you all know, appears to suggest that one cannot exclude the subject in question as possibly being baby Albert. There are certainly facial similarities based upon my observations, even taking into account the differential chronological age of the subjects depicted. In conclusion, the two photographs could be the same individual. If all we had were the photographic data, I would not make a case that Douglas was Albert. But we have much more. And so I'd like to more or less summarize that with you. Here's what we know about Albert and what we know about Douglas. We know that Albert's mother lived in, at, on the Hopkins <coughs> campus at this time of the study. We know that our Villa Irons lived on the campus at the time of the study. We know that Albert's mother was a wet nurse. We know that Douglas was born on March 9th, so his mother was probably lactating at the time of the study. We know his mother worked in the Harriet Lane home. We know our villa worked in the Harriet Lane home. We know the study was conducted in the winter of 1919-1920. We know that our villa was on campus then. We know that Albert lived almost his entire first year at the Harriet Lane home. We know the same thing about Douglas. We know that his almost his entire first year was spent there. Remember, there were never more than four babies there at any one time. We also know that Albert and Douglas were, were males. We know that Albert appears to be Caucasian, and we know that Douglas was. We know that films, letters, and Watson's writing indicate a baseline occurred between November 28th and December 12th, 1919. And we know that Douglas was probably on campus at that time. We don't have his exact uh, presence uh, pointed to, but certainly his mother was, and probably he was too. We know Albert was born between the 2nd and 16th of March. Douglas was born on the 9th. And we also know that there is a physical resemblance between the two boys. Although some of these attributes are shared by more than one person. The probability that the complete set applies to anyone except Albert must, in our opinion, be very small. The available evidence strongly supports the proposition that Douglas Marie was little Albert. After 90 years, psychology's 
lost boy has come home. Gary Helen, Helen is Gary's wife, and I set flowers on our villa's grave. Then we drove several miles to the Church of the Brethren. Beside this church is a small, well-kept cemetery. I followed Gary to a modest-sized tombstone. It read, Douglas, son of our Villa Marie, March 9, 1919 to May 10th, 1925. Below his name were inscribed lines from a Felicia Hemans point. The sunbeams smiled, the zephyr's breath, all it knew from birth to death. Standing beside Douglas's grave, my prevailing feelings were ones of loneliness. <coughs> Douglas never grew up. Our search was longer than the child's life. The quest, which has for so long been a part of my life, was over. I put flowers beside my little friend, said goodbye, and walked to the car. Whatever happened to little Douglas? We may never know if he experienced any long-term negative effects from his condition. We did discover that the robust child shown in Watson's film became sickly after leaving the Harriet Lane home. His death certificate states that Douglas developed hydrocephalus in 1922. Acquired hydrocephalus results from a variety of diseases and disorders, including encephalitis, meningitis, and brain tumors. We were unable to determine the cause of Douglas's death illness, but a reasonable supposition is that he contacted meningitis from Flora Brashears. To conclude, that Douglas's story ended in a rural Maryland graveyard overlooks much of the meaning of his life. Although we found no indication that Watson and Rayner's procedures provoked criticisms in the 1920s, Douglas's treatment now exemplifies the need for an ethical code to protect the rights of participants. All behavior therapists trace their lineage to Mary Cover Jones's counter-conditioning of Peter which was a follow-up to the Albert investigation. Watson and Rayner's simple study of fear acquisition and generalization <laughs> encouraged the development of effective treatment for phobias and an array of other behavioral problems. Ironically, millions of people have benefited from a therapeutic movement which began with a procedurally and ethically flawed attempt to condition an ordinary little boy. Thank you for your attention.